Beyond Gene Lists, Biological Analysis Strategies for Gene Expression Data, presented by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of Gen, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. As many of you have probably been realizing, which is probably why you're here today, gene expression research is rapidly evolving beyond basic statistical or data-driven analysis, where the final result is a list of significantly changed genes. Researchers are now faced with an increased need for stronger biological interpretation of omics data in order to successfully publish and guide the next steps in the laboratory. This webinar will demonstrate why a biologically-based analysis approach is emerging as a crucial strategy for validated, mechanistically supported biological conclusions. The three speakers today, Olga Tryanska, Shelley Dertaj, and Stuart Tugandrayich, sorry, have extensive experience with biological data strategies, analysis strategies, and tools. They've tried out many new technologies and ultimately adapted several that have helped them gain a better understanding of their gene expression data. They will share their insights and enabling practices with us in just a minute. Before we get started, though, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our panelists at any time during the presentations. We'll answer as many questions as we can after the final presentation. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and hit Submit. Um, Dr. Olga Transka, a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Princeton, is our first speaker. She's going to talk to us about the importance of putting data in the context of known biological information, and she'll go through some examples of how our lab is currently doing this type of integrated biological analysis. She'll explain how these strategies help guide specific experimentally testable hypotheses about protein function, interactions, and regulations in human disease. Olga, we're ready when you are. Thank you, Tamlin, and uh, I'm going to talk today about data-driven functional genomics approaches to the study of human disease. Next slide. Uh, so just to give you an overview of the sort of problems that my group thinks about and the sort of problems that I really think are very important to this webinar is we really would like to address the question of why is there so much of this functional genomic data, um, anything from sequencing gene expression, physical interaction studies, next generation sequencing approaches, studies on protein domains, transcription factor binding, et cetera, and we are generating billions of times more data points than we had ever imagined, let's say, 10, 20 years ago. Yet we clearly don't know that much more about biology. We've learned a lot from these studies, but we still really need to dig into these data deeper to be able to understand them in the context of our existing biological knowledge, as well as in the context of what sort of noise and signal levels we have in these data sets. So the sort of questions that I really think are very important here is that we really need to try to put these data together in perspective with the knowledge that we've learned from traditional biologists from the past century or so uh, to try to understand how these proteins and other macromolecules work together in the cell to accomplish specific biological tasks. So uh, here we have an example of uh, DNA repair related pathways. And then trying to understand this and model this uh, based on these diverse types of data should enable us to look at this in the context of metazone organisms. So in reality, of course, metazones are quite complicated, and so these pathways are actually potentially working differently and sometimes completely on or off, uh, depending on which cell lineage and tissue type, and of course, also developmental stage we're looking at. And then, of course, once we have these models that are really put in the context of the specific um, biological and biomedical um, questions that we're looking at, we should be able to directly use them to try to understand specific questions of molecular level of disease as well as drug targeting. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a sense of how all of these can be done, uh, or at least how we've approached all of these by combining these very large collections of functional genomics data with some of the existing biological knowledge from curated data sets. Uh, next slide. So we're going to focus right now first on the first step of this, and that is trying to integrate, and you can think of it as summarizing, these very diverse large data collections. So the question here is can we take basically every piece of gene expression, physical interaction, uh, sequence, and other data that we have for a given organism, uh, we're going to mostly focus on human here, and try to summarize it in these pathway models. I'm going to simplify the pathway models here, and here there's actually a cut of one of our um, existing models, actually, from a system that I'll tell you about in a second. And that's that same exact DNA damage repair pathway focusing on BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, but now looking at a functional relationship network. So 
the key point here to understand is that the connections between proteins here, represented by the red lines, uh, don't mean a specific type of interaction. So that does not mean necessarily physical interaction or transcriptional regulatory interaction. It means that these two proteins are working together and have a functional relationship. So some of these connections will, in fact, represent a direct physical interaction, like BRCA1 and BRCA2. Some might be regulatory. And a lot of times, by looking into which data was used to predict each of these interactions, uh, we would be able to actually realize what specific interaction type that is. Next slide, please. So the way we're going to really make these predictions is by combining this large collection of functional genomic data. And in fact, my group regularly has pipelines to download data from all sorts of different uh, data repositories. So we have thousands and thousands of gene expression data sets, RNA-seq data, uh, all sorts of sequence analysis and things like that, as well as prior knowledge. So this might be coming from collections like Ingenuity's curated data or MIPS or CAG on the gene ontology, basically really careful curations of data from the literature. And then uh, next slide. We're going to use computational models to answer different types of specific biological questions that generally fall into these sort of general categories. So the first category would be really trying to just understand what do proteins do? Can we assign function to genes? So is this a mitochondria-related protein or a cell cycle protein? Next slide. How do they interact with each other? So how do proteins interact in these pathways to accomplish the specific tasks like DNA damage repair or mitochondrial biogenesis? Next slide. How do these processes work together? So in this case, we call them functions, but essentially how do processes interrelate and how does signaling work to be able to have cell cycle and DNA damage repair, for example, decoupled? Next slide. And finally, on a more technical level, what sort of experiments, what sort of data sets are most informative for a study of specific processes? Next slide. So all of these are going to be the sort of questions that we'll answer. And specifically, we're going to use um, different types of machine learning or uh, basically advanced computational tools to do this. I'll give you a very intuitive uh, sense of how this works in next slide. One of the sort of uh, methods that we use is the Bayesian network. And so the idea here is that we're trying to summarize huge collection of thousands of different gene expression data sets, physical interaction data sets, colocalization data, sequences, et cetera, that's really trying to tell us something about whether two proteins, in this example, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are functionally related. So to be able to summarize this and to predict this level of relationship, of course, for BRCA1 and BRCA2, we actually know the answer, but can we predict this for proteins for which we actually don't know the answer? We need to basically figure out which of these data sets in our collection are actually relevant to the question at hand, right? Because some of the data sets might be irrelevant to the question of DNA damage repair. Some of them might simply be bad. This is a huge public collection. Some of the early data sets might just be low quality data, et cetera. So how can we do that? We use this method called Bayesian networks. And essentially, it, re it has this functional model of the fact that the functional relationship depends on these diverse types of data and it's weighted by the biological context. The biological context is really the biological question you want to study. So a data set that's very relevant to cell cycle or DNA damage repair might be completely irrelevant to the question, for example, of membrane biogenesis. So you can imagine gene expression data sets are not going to be very informative for most membrane biogenesis questions versus a gene expression data set that's looking at response to DNA damage repair, proteins knockdown would be very relevant to the questions related to DNA damage repair. So our Bayesian networks actually can automatically weigh data sets based on some examples of known relationships between protein. And that's where the knowledge, the curated data is coming in. So if we have sets of proteins where we know that these pairs of proteins do work together in that biological context, so for example, in DNA damage repair, such as BRCA1 and BRCA2 and others, then given those pairs, we can feed them to our methods and essentially they learn based on what the patterns between these proteins look like in the data collections that we have, the data sets that are very good at telling us, yes, these proteins work together for the proteins that we know work together, we can then use to predict new relationships. 
So that's really the intuition behind that. So we use examples of known relationships from the really the traditional existing curated biological knowledge to be able to look at the, in a data-driven way and predict completely novel relationships that are not actually present in this knowledge base and that are really coming from this large uh, collection of functional genomics data. Next slide. So can we start looking at these uh, networks in a tissue-specific way? And the answer is indeed we can. It's very challenging and it again relies on very carefully curated gold standards, uh, but we can actually take large collections of not necessarily tissue resolved uh, functional genomics data and make reasonably accurate predictions of tissue and even cell lineage specific um, gene expression and networks. I'm not going to get into details on this just because of time constraints, but I'll show you an example. Next slide. So here's a kidney network, subnetwork. So this is the sort of uh, integration that I've talked about, but we actually do it in a tissue-specific way. And if you query it with uh, several proteins that are podocyte-specific proteins, so podocyte is uh, one of the cell types that's really the key filtering responsible cell type in the kidney glomeruli. If we query this network with some podocyte-specific proteins, we bring in a number of other proteins that are, in fact, also podocyte-specific, like the Carol's as well as some others that are similar to known protocyte-specific markers like somatin and SOMA3. Next slide. We can also look again at Alzheimer's disease. So here is a picture of a subset of the brain network. And here we're querying with uh, three proteins that are known to be related to Alzheimer's. So uh, here's Apoe, our friend. And then you can see that those bold connections between proteins, they're not selected by us. They're actually the most uh, confident edges, so the most prominent connections based on the data that were integrated. And every single one of these strongly connected genes is not in our gold standard, and yet all of them have literature evidence connecting them to either uh, having brain gene expression or having some associated with Alzheimer's. Next slide. So hopefully convinced you that basically by combining careful curation of uh, literature evidence, we can actually use a data-driven view of these very large collections and really find novel biology that is experimentally verifiable and that can be actually drilling down to even uh, tissue-specific and even potentially cell in your specific level and that is relevant to disease. But can we actually more directly look at uh, disease-specific proteins with these sort of tools? And so next I'm going to talk about how can we try to essentially do a functional genomics GWAS. Like essentially can we take functional genomics data and try to find new disease-associated genes. Next slide. And this is work in mouse in collaboration with uh, Matthew Hibbs and Carol Bald's group at the Jackson Laboratory. Next slide. Just to give you a really quick overview of how this works is we take a number of data sources, again, including uh, gene expression data sets, protein, protein physical interactions, phylogenetics profiles, et cetera. We integrate them just like I've told you about with Bayesian networks in a tissue-specific way. So we essentially make those tissue-specific networks just like, like the examples that I've shown you above for human brain and uh, human kidney. But we do it for a number of different tissues in mouse. And what we're going to use is we're going to use another machine learning method that I won't go into, but we're going to try to use those networks as a way to find new proteins that are involved in specific mammalian phenotypes in mouse. So can we use groups of proteins that are known to have a certain phenotype, put them on this network, so if you look at this network in the upper right-hand corner, there's some proteins that are red. So imagine these are the proteins that have a known phenotype association, so which of those gray proteins that don't have a known effect on this particular phenotype might, based on this network, be predicted to actually have also be associated with that same phenotype? So can we basically make new disease or phenotype, in this case, gene predictions? Next slide. And as a bioinformatician, I have to show you a couple of uh, evaluation graphs, or they'll take my card away, but uh, this is very briefly does this actually work well? It turns out it works actually quite well. So if we look at phenotypes of different sizes, so the upper left-hand graph, AUC is just a measure of how accurate 
prostates are, and AUC of 0.8 is actually very good for mammalian predictions. And you can see for phenotypes that are even as small as 30 to 100 genes, that's the x-axis, we're actually doing quite well. So we get an average AUC of 0 0.75, 0 0.8. You can think of this as approximate measure of essentially accuracy. So it's not exactly, but um, that's essentially a good way to think about it. So we can accurately predict diverse phenotypes. And these predictions are actually robust across body systems. So you can see in the lower right-hand corner, it, for a number of different body systems, from immune to cardiovascular to renal, we can actually make predictions that are approximately of equal accuracy. Next slide. And in fact, it really helps to look at tissue-specific uh, networks. So if we actually make networks that are not tissue-specific, our prediction accuracy does actually drop. So that's the upper left-hand graph, the blue versus the red bars. Next slide. So hopefully I've given you enough examples to convince you that really being able to dig in these detailed functional genomics data sets, either in your favorite data set that you've just carefully created, or even in these large functional genomic data collections, or what I would encourage you to do also in your data in the context of the functional genomic data connections, when you use both traditional biological knowledge that's essentially in the literature, curated from the literature, and approaches that allow you to use this to look really in a data-driven way, you can actually find quite significant novel biological hypotheses that can really allow you to target your future experiments. So in the future, I'm hoping that these sort of approaches, not just ours and not just any specific type, but really approaches that utilize these collections of functional genomic data or your own functional genomic data sets in a careful way where you can really use existing knowledge that we already have accumulated about biology to look in a smart way at these very large, very noisy data sets and potentially in combining a number of different data sets to really create the context for this biology to be able to give us very specific and accurate models of molecular pathways that will then allow us to really integrate the microscopic biology with macroscopic physiology and in the future really understand how that differs across development, across our different genotypes, across our different cell lineages and tissue types in our body to really bring us to that big, right, the personalized medicine future that uh, we're all really hoping we'll get there. But really, that's how I'm hoping we'd be able to combine these large data sets and really get the most out of them. Next slide. And finally, I really want to thank everyone who's actually done the work, so all of my former and current students, as well as collaborators. And uh, you can find all of the software I've described on our website, function.press.edu. Thanks very much, and back to you, Tamlin. Thanks, Olga. Before we go on to our next speaker, I want to remind you that you can submit questions at any time by take, typing a question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your screen and hitting Submit. Our second speaker is Shelley Ann des Etage, lecturer in the Department of Biology and Health Sciences at Pace University. Her presentation will showcase some strategies she's used to get biological meaning out of statistically challenging data sets. She'll talk about how she was able to obtain a more precise biological understanding about what was happening in insulin-resistant versus insulin-sensitive individuals by examining her data in relation to signaling pathways and by building custom molecular networks based on expression data and known biological information. Shelley, you're up. Thank you, Tamlin. So today I'm going to talk to you about the effect of insulin resistance state on human adipose. And this was a study that we did based on data published by Dorothy Sears and her group. Next slide. This gives you a brief summary of um, the slide deck that I'm going to describe to you today. And it also provides you some background on insulin resistance. Next slide. So here we've got a figure showing insulin resistance from a review by Jerry Oleski and Glass. And we can see, if we focus on the adipose, that in the state of obesity, if we look closely at the adipose tissue, we will see that the adipose cells themselves become significantly enlarged because in the obese state, we have a lot of circulating fatty acids 
and the fat tissue is trying its best to absorb the fat, the glucose, and convert it to fat. Now, once the fat cells actually outgrow their blood supply, there occurs an inflammatory state within the adipose. And so you see that you have hypertrophic adipocytes. In addition to that, you have recruitment of macrophages into the adipocytes as a result of the hypertrophy. And there's a polarity switch that occurs in the macrophages leading to increased cytokine production, lipolysis, and ER stress. And this is an essential part of the insulin resistant state within the adipose. Now to the left you see what's happening in the skeletal muscle is you have increased free fatty acid uptake into the skeletal muscle and you have an increase in the amount of extra myocellular adipose. And this also leads to a macrophage activation and recruitment. Within the liver, we have steatosis occurring. And so all of these combine to cause a state of systemic insulin resistance. And keep in mind that what we're focusing on today is the adipocytes. Next slide. So here's the design of the study that was published by the Sayers Group. And you have the reference for the publication to the lower left, and you can see that it was from PNAS. And essentially what the study focused on was investigating the effect of PZD treatment on gene expression in muscle and adipose from insulin-resistant patients. So what they did is they collected recruited individuals and took muscle biopsies prior to starting any PZD treatment. Muscle and adipose biopsies were taken at the start of a five-hour class. Biopsies were again taken from the muscle at the end of the five-hour class. Now these results were used to determine which patients were insulin sensitive and which ones were insulin resistant. The patients that were insulin resistant were then put on three months of PCD treatment, and after the three months of PCD treatment, they were again subjected to a clamp and biopsies taken at the start of the clamp and at the end of the clamp. And panel B shows you the results. It's showing you the glucose disposal rate. And you can see in panel B, shown in blue to the lower right, are the folks who have normal glucose disposal levels. And then to the left, you see in yellow, red, and in a lighter pink, the individuals who did not have normal glucose disposal. And those were defined as insulin resistant. Another interesting thing that you see is that there's quite a bit of variability within the insulin resistant group, and this is based on how well some of these individuals responded to the TCD treatment described in the paper. Next slide. And what I'm highlighting is the fact that the analysis I'm going to describe today focuses entirely on the pre-TCD adipose biopsies. Okay, next slide. So this is just a cartoon to show the data analysis process. We took the data that had been submitted into um, the public database repositories and they, they used Affymetrix arrays for the purpose of this paper. So there were about 54,000 probe sets on the array. We used RNA processing and sample QC to remove any arrays that looked like the overall images were poor, and that actually reduced the number of probe sets to 16,800. And then we did normalization and application of a model to ask what are the probe sets that show a difference between the insulin resistant and sensitive day. And if we look at the raw p-values for that analysis, we see we have just shy of 4,000 probe sets. And if we use adjusted p-values where we corrected for multiple t-tests, we have 1,005 probe sets. We then look at what is the difference in gene expression, the full change difference, comparing sensitive to resistant, and you can see the numbers there. We have 587 that were 1.5-fold or more, and a raw p-value of point, less than 0.05, and then we had 356 <laughs> that had a raw adjusted p-value of less than 0.05.
And so these were the lists that we took and uploaded into the IPA tools for some further analysis and exploration. Next slide. So before we get into the analysis that we did, I wanted to briefly review the published findings from this data set. And according to the paper, when they compared the insulin resistance to the insulin sensitive adipose, there were some very interesting categories that came up. One was inflammation related ontology categories, the immune system processes, extracellular matrix, and MHC class II receptor activity. And there was also reported changes in antigen processing and presentation and leukocyte transendothelial migration. Those are the major classes that were described based on the differential expression data. The authors also reported changes in mitochondrial oxidation of fatty acids, TCA cycle, and oxidation phosphorylation. And these were based on correlating the gene expression data with the insulin resistance status. So on the next slide, I'm going to give you a high-level overview of what we saw when we put this data into the IPA tool. So I'm showing here a bar chart that's listing different categories of cellular function and then a negative log p-value. So essentially, the higher the bar, the more significance there was, and there's a really faint threshold line that shows where the minus log of 0.05 is. And what we see here is what I'm calling category A, kind of encompasses all the different functions associated with leukocyte migration. B, I'm pointing to antigen presentation, which was also identified by <laughs> the paper. And C, D, E, and F are the other categories they identify that were not necessarily immediately obvious from this particular view. Next slide. Here we're just looking at the metabolic and signaling pathways, and we can see that we see some inflammation-related ontology category highlighted by the A. Um, highlighted by C up above is the citrate cycle and B fatty acid metabolism. So we're seeing that the categories of cellular function and metabolic signaling pathways that we're identifying by IPA certainly overlap with those that were identified by the original authors. So this gives us some confirmation that the analysis that we did is confirmed by the analysis that existed already and that any findings we have that were not reported in the paper have a reasonable chance of being real since our analysis strategy yielded similar results to the authors. Next slide. So since this is a question about insulin resistance, one area that I was curious about was what happened in insulin signaling pathway. And if we look at this view of the insulin receptor signaling pathway where we've overlaid the gene expression data and had it color on the basis of full change, you can see that there's a very little occurring. We see some really, really small, minuscule change in TC10 and RAS and a little bit of upregulation of ATP citrate lyase, but not much else. Next slide. Now, if we overlay on the basis of the raw p-value, we see that there's quite a bit more occurring in the insulin receptor signaling pathway than previously recognized almost easily over 50% of the nodes in this pathway are highlighted. So essentially, we may not be getting very large fold change, but certainly there's some activity, a lot of activity occurring within the pathway. Next slide. So there are two ways to think about mining the data. We can ask what are the pathways and the functions that are strongly affected, and once we identify that, figure out how they tie to the known phenotype, which is in this case our insulin resistance, and to the signaling biology. Another approach is to ask what are the pathways that we're most interested in, and ask how those pathways were affected, and then what the implications of the observed changes are. So these are two 
quite different approaches because one approach is based entirely on what did I see in the data and the other begins with what are my expectations about what should be happening in the data and therefore I start looking in the area where my expectations lie. Next slide. So if we go back to the view of the metabolic and signaling pathways, I've highlighted all of the pathways that are information related, but as you can see, all the bars that are not marked with A are bars that represent signaling or metabolic pathways that were affected in this data set. So there are lots of other things to look at beyond our preset question with regard to inflammation. So we are actually seeing changes, effects in IL-8 signaling, in LPS IL-1 mediated inhibition of RxR, NF-kappa B signaling, and toll like receptor signaling. So certainly you can argue that IL-8 signaling will fall under inflammation as might IL-1, but what I decided to do here was to take toll like receptor signaling and just explore that a little further. Next slide. So toll-like receptor signaling, so there's two toll receptors that are frequently discussed, TLR4 and TLR2. Now TLR4, we know that it's expressed in macrophages, and this receptor binds to LPS and can be triggered by saturated fatty acids. And it can also have a blunting of the fatty acid effect on inflammation when it's absent. So it's clear that the toll-like receptor have at least to like receptor 4, has a role in an inflammatory process that has the potential to be triggered by saturated fatty acids. To like receptor 2 binds different components of bacteria, fungi, parasites, and viruses. And if it's inhibited, you get an improvement in insulin sensitivity in high fat fed mice. However, the overall role of to like receptor signaling in insulin resistance is unclear. Next slide. So I decided to take a look at what the toll-like receptor signaling pathway looks like in the data set. And you can see here that we had some decrease in toll-like receptor 2 itself in IRAC1, in the LPS receptor, CD14, and in MD2. So we're seeing an overall dampening in the toll-like receptor signaling pathway, and specifically around TLR2. Next slide. So I thought maybe let's dig a little deeper and go beyond the signaling map. So what I did is I used the IPA tool to pull up the toll-like receptor 2 interaction network, which is essentially a visualization of all the available information in that database on toll-like receptor and the genes that it affects. So gets you a hairball, a neat hairball, but a hairball nonetheless. Next slide. So don't panic. We can actually use the data that we have in hand to refine this network or hairball and identify which parts of it are active in the data. Next slide. So the first step is to actually analyze, overlay the data with the analyzed gene expression. And that's what I've done here. So if you look at the figure, you'll see a couple little nodes that are colored blue because they are showing some change as a result of our data. So the next step would be to remove the nodes that are not affected in the data set. Now, one caveat with this approach is that it's much more effective with expression relationships. So you can imagine that you can have a node that might be phosphorylating another protein. It's very important for the pathway, but you're not necessarily going to see a change in expression of a kinase. So while this is an approach to refining a network, it certainly has its caveats. So once we've removed the nodes, next slide, and now we're looking at a view where the nodes have been removed and all we have left are the nodes that were affected somehow in the data set. And you can see the CD14 actually had a two-fold down regulation, VCAN about a 1.8-fold, the integrin A about a negative 1.5-fold. 
Now, once we've taken this step and refined the network down to the nodes that were affected, we can then add any relevant connections because there may be connections among these nodes that are not reflected here. Next slide. And once we've done that, we can actually open up nodes to identify any groups. So you can see here that I've opened up the chemokine node, and we can see all the different chemokines that are part of this group, but only CCL19 was actually affected. So our next step would be to clean that up and remove the unaffected nodes and keep CCL19 present. Okay, so our next step, the next slide, we can see how we can use this process to actually begin to grow this network out a little bit more, as I've done with the MSC Class II complex, where we've broken that out into some of its subcomponents. And one thing to keep in mind that as we move through this process, if we do not have nodes where there's large fold change, we can certainly use p-value for added sensitivity. So next slide. And so now you see that we've begun to go node by node. So we start with TLR2 in the middle, and as we look at the nodes around TLR2, we can begin to expand those and find out what areas of this TLR2 pathway or network are more active, were more affected by the insulin resistance state than others. Next slide. And this is just wanted to make a point about p-value versus fold change. So what we're looking at here is a side-by-side -side view of exactly the same network. TLR2 is towards the center, right? If you start at the top and go down towards the middle, TLR2 is just right in the middle to the near the top. And you can see that it's beginning to grow out and become quite large. And if you compare p-value versus fold change, you can look and see that if you look down below to the two exploded areas down below, you can see by full change there's not really anything happening. But if you go to the left and you look at the p-value view, which is colored in that cyan blue, you can see that there are a lot of nodes that are affected. So I think that both readouts have value and that we should not be trading one over the other. In this particular case, when we look at what was being highlighted by the p-values, we were seeing nodes such as NF-kappa B, C, B, P, IL-1, LBP, TNF, among others. Next slide. So we can then begin to examine the edges in the network that we've built. I'm showing you the network that we've built over to the left we have incorporated some of the nodes that showed an effect on the basis of raw p-value. And we can then begin to really inter interrogate the edges and look at what relation type there is connecting to different nodes. So in this particular case, we are looking at insulin resistant versus sensitive adipose. If we click on one of those edges and it tells us that you know, these two proteins interact only in liver cells, for example, in mice, and that's the only data suggesting a link between two nodes, then you would classify that as a weaker link because we're not working on liver here. We're looking at adipose, and we're looking at human. We're not looking at mouse. So we need to really investigate the nodes and ask the question, do these make sense? Does the relationship between the two make sense? And is it consistent with what my data is telling me about the system? And within the IPA2, of course, you have different views. So to the right, we're looking at a pathway design view where you can define cellular ge geography and show your nucleus, your cell membrane, your cytoplasm, and if need be, you can add different organelles to this view. Next slide. So when we think about adipose insulin resistance, the literature points to a decrease in TLR2 and 4 in muscle preventing insulin resistance. 
Our data is showing increased expression of TLR2 and its downstream components in insulin-resistant adipose. There really isn't anything in the literature about TLR2 having a role in insulin resistance in adipose tissue. So the question becomes, can we link the increased expression of TLR2 to increase inflammatory cytokines and adipokines that are characteristic of the insulin resistance state in adipose? So this just is a question that I want to pose. Next slide. So this is about linking TLR2 to adiponectin, which is a really well-known adipokine, is a list of all of the chemokines. And you can just see the different chemokines, separated extracellular space, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, nucleus, and unknown location. Next slide. So we can overlay this chemokines simply based on which are the chemokines that were active in our data set. And you can see that that reduces the number of chemokines we're looking at very quickly. Next slide. We can actually begin to use the tool to ask the question, can I link a diponectin to TLR, TLR2? Are there opportunities for me to find a link between this toll-like receptor 2 that I've observed change in expression and adiponectin, which is an adipokine that we see change in level in the insulin resistance state. And we're looking at the tool that actually allows you to try to build those types of links. So next slide. What we're looking at here is incorporation of some of the potential paths into the tool. And so if we start with TLR2, that's now the right, one of the rightmost nodes, we can see that there's a suggestion that it's affected by IL-1B and TNF. TNF and IL-1B, if you follow the dotted lines going away from those two nodes, they go to CEBP, alpha, and beta. And then there are solid arrows connecting CBP alpha and beta to a diponectin. So essentially, what we have here is a potential hypothesis to explain how an effect on TLR2 expression could potentially lead to an effect on the diponectin expression. Next slide. So in essence, essentially, to conclude, IPA tool identified the same pathways that were flagged as enriched by the GOBI tools used in the paper, and we were able to use the tool to further explore TLR signaling pathway. There are no recognized direct links between TLR2 and the inflammatory cytokines observed in the insulin resistance state, but based on some of the analysis that we've done, the transcription factors CBP alpha and beta may represent a link between TLR2 signaling and the interponectin levels. And so to summarize, we were able to use the, the data and the tools to develop a hypothesis that can now be tested and further explored. And so my next slide is just some acknowledgments for the support of the CV Med Department in Pfizer and Ingenuity Systems, and I'd like to thank Genetic Engineering News for this opportunity. Back to you, Tamlin. Thanks, Shelley. Um, if you have any questions for Shelley, please Thank submit. Tamlin. All right, here we go again. Thanks, Shelley. Um, if you have any questions for Shelley, please submit them now by typing your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your screen and hit, con and hit submit. Okay, our third and final speaker, Stuart, is uh, Stuart Tugen Drake, a Product Management Director at Ingenuity Systems. He'll demonstrate some biological analysis strategies using microarray data from ulcerative colitis patients. You'll see how you can correct phenotypic observations with relevant biology and how to identify the most interesting genes for follow-up by using tools that help you really explore the biology underlying your experimental changes. Um, Stuart, uh, we're ready for you now. Thank you, Tamlin. Hi, I'm Stuart Tugendreich, Director of Product Management at Ingenuity Systems. First, I just want to thank our last two 
panelists for those great presentations. There's clearly a common thread running through these presentations that what we're really talking about here are strategies for biological analysis that puts expression data in the context of broader biological themes and processes for a more in-depth understanding of your research. I'm going to present a workflow that will show you in a bit more detail how you can use these strategies to go from a list of significant genes to getting mechanistic biological understanding of your experimental results. Next slide, please. Just a few years ago, you could publish a heat map or a table of genes that change significantly in different experimental conditions, such as in a disease state like cancer. And this is exciting and novel because we could study so many genes at once. But now that sort of massively parallel data exploration is commonplace, and you see microarray data regularly in all kinds of research applications. Publishers and granting agencies now require you to have a more detailed understanding of the meaning behind your significant gene list. This has been a real challenge for scientists who are trying to interpret what the significant changes in these large lists of genes actually mean. The key is that to come up with compelling results, you need to have an understanding of how your gene list relates to known biology. By biology, we mean things like signaling and metabolic pathways, biological phenotypes and diseases, etc. But there's simply no way for a scientist to memorize what every gene does, how it relates to other genes, proteins, RNAs, and phenotypes that come up in a data set. So what we're going to show you are some strategies that help you make biological sense of the significant genes that come up in data using IPA software. Next slide, please. The example we're showing you today is a microarray experiment that was validated by qPCR. For a little background, the authors were studying ulcerative colitis, UC for short, a type of inflammatory bowel disease that affects the lining of the large intestine and rectum. It can be treated by infliximab, which is also known as Remicade or IFX, which is an anti-TNF-alpha monoclonal antibody drug. The mechanism of this drug, other than the fact that it is an anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha antibody, is not understood. The authors, as part of their goals, wanted to understand a few things. One is, what is the impact of infliximab treatment? They wanted to figure this out by understanding the resultant changes in gene expression. So one goal is to figure out what the treatment is actually doing on a gene level. The second is to figure out if they can distinguish between patient subgroups. Also, they wanted to use qPCR to follow up and validate gene expression changes for every gene they thought was important, which is a common workflow, especially in research for publication or grants. The methods they used were to analyze microarray data from colonic biopsies from patients assigned as non-responders or responders. They used IPA for their biological analysis, and I'm going to show you steps how you can apply this kind of approach to your own research. Next slide, please. Here you can see the steps we'll take to get a deeper understanding of the involved biology. We'll see how gene expression changes differ for different patient groups, discover differences in pathway activity between patient groups, identify molecules that might be central drivers of the gene expression changes, and use pathway tools to discover interesting genes for follow-up. Next slide, please. This slide helps to explain the different patient subgroups. Ulcerative colitis, patients had biopsies that were used to generate mRNA samples for the microarray data. Each patient had a Mayo score, which is a standard calculation for UC based on a variety of information, including patient reporting, such as blood in the stool, clinician evaluation, et cetera. Based on the Mayo score, the patients were divided into responders and non-responders to the drug or to the placebo. Within the groups, there are different time points of different treatments. They were treated with either infliximab or placebo, and we're going to focus on week eight data. As a side note, there were week 30 data used by the authors, but we've chosen to focus solely on week eight data for this presentation simply because of the nature of clinical data where patients, especially non-responders, drop out in a higher proportion over time. Ultimately, we're trying to answer the question, how does the gene expression differ between responders and non-responders? A point of note is that, again, some patients got placebo treatment but still registered as responders. This is the placebo effect because some people still get better when you administer a placebo. The treatment is blind. So clinicians don't know if the patient got the placebo or drug, and the responder status is just based on the Mayo score. What's interesting about this biological analysis approach is that it clearly highlights that from a uh, gene expression perspective, the placebo responders are completely different from treated responders. In fact, all four groups have really distinct profiles, which you'll see shortly. Next slide. What we started with is, in this analysis is a list of statistically significant genes, genes that have significantly changed expression in the patients that were treated versus untreated, and responders and non-responders. Everything is compared to week zero. 
We're going to take this list of genes, which we do not know enough to publish on, and show you how to turn that list into something that contains meaningful biology for publication. Next slide, please. We've uploaded a significant gene table into IPA for analysis, and here is the IPA functional analysis of week eight data. This is analysis is possible because IPA uses a knowledge base of scientific information from the published literature, which helps it relate genes to the functional categories that those genes are known to participate in. So on the y-axis of the graph, you see the significance of the effect based on p-value for how well the up and down regulated genes in each patient group map to various functional categories. The most significant functional category on the left is inflammatory response. The red bar is responders to infliximab treatment. You can see they have the most significant genes that relate to this functional category. The pink bar next to that is infliximab treated patients who did not respond based again on the Mayo score. You can see that they have fewer significant genes involved in inflammatory response, specifically down from 83 to 12. The dark blue and light blue bars are for placebo responders in dark blue and non-responders in light blue. They show a similar drop in the number of genes for inflammatory response relative to drug response. So many of the other functional categories are returned, like the involvement of immune cells in, our, in the experiment. Because we know that TNF-alpha is involved in inflammatory processes, we're going to drill into the category in more depth. But to summarize, going into this, we didn't know the mechanism of the, of the infliximab treatment downstream of the interaction with the antibody. Understanding these functional categories help you start to understand mechanism. The authors also didn't know the difference between the patient subgroups. You can pick out a big difference between treatments and response. But you could have gotten some of this from the heat maps. With IPA, you can actually see how they translate into biological themes between the data sets. Next slide, please. In IPA, you can quickly examine each of these functional categories to see what is going on on the gene level. If you click on each of the bars for inflammatory response, you can see which genes drove the significant results for each patient subgroup. Here, for responders, you can see the large number of genes that are affected by the drug. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the results of the functional analysis. This took less than five minutes in IPA. We've run a quick comparison of the groups and popped open the results. It's very quick to drill down to a set of genes that are driving your results. We were able to understand that fliximab treatment results in decreased expression of a particular set of genes associated with inflammatory response. Patients that respond to treatment show that more genes are downregulated compared to non-responders. A few genes do change expression after placebo treatment, but you can very easily differentiate between placebo responders and infliximab responders based on gene expression alone. So we've very quickly gotten some pretty straightforward answers to some of the author's main questions. Next, let's get a more detailed understanding of what's going on here by looking at the effects on known signaling pathways for responders versus non-responders. Let's see how they differ. Next slide, please. Here, IPA has done a pathway analysis of the data. The two pathways that show the biggest difference in gene expression between responders and non-responders are complement system and TREM1 pathways, which are both relevant to the immune systems. From here, we can click through to view a map of each pathway, and this is extremely powerful. You see which genes in the pathway were upregulated or downregulated in our data set. Next slide, please. So this is part of the complement signaling pathway. The green genes are significantly downregulated in the infliximab responders, indicating a suppression of the complement pathway by the drug. What's also really helpful is that this is an interactive map. You can click on any line that represents an interaction between genes to access the literature that supports the interaction. This is one of the really handy benefits of using a tool that combines content and data analysis in one place. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at non-responder data, you can see that the infliximab-treated patients don't show any effect on this pathway. The gray coloring in these genes mean that they didn't change significantly. So the difference between the responders and non-responders in re respect to this pathway become really obvious. Next slide, please. The other pathway that came up was TREM1 signaling. TREM1 amplifies acute inflammatory responses by enhancing degranulation and secretion of pro-inflammatory mediators. This pathway shows the downregulation of certain cytokines of the pathway. Those are shown in squares. And you can see that TREM1 itself is downregulated. That's in the middle at the top, along with several pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are interspersed throughout. If you find a gene you're unfamiliar with or aren't certain how it relates to the information you're looking at, you can use gene views in IPA to read a detailed description of the gene, along with a wide range of information about it from the literature. Next slide, please. This is the gene view for TREM1. 
This type of information can bring you up to speed on any unfamiliar gene and help you understand if it's relevant to your question. Next slide, please. GeneView helps you get to information that informs your hypothesis or expectations. Here we quickly found a paper that confirms our emerging suspicion that suppression of TREM1 is relevant to improvement of disease symptoms. In this paper, they found that it helped, in fact, improve the histopathology in their model when they suppressed the gene. The point is that for anything that comes up that is interesting in these pathways, you can get more information. Next slide, please. So far in IPA, the signaling pathway analysis took our significant list of genes and quickly helped us see that for responders, infliximab treatment caused decreased expression of genes in complement signaling and TREM1 signaling, while the non-responders who got the treatment only showed a limited change for these pathways. You can also differentiate between response groups by gene expression, so your next question is probably, what molecules might be the central drivers of these gene expression changes? Next slide, please. Here we're looking at a network analysis in IPA. IPA uses an algorithm that finds connections among genes in your data set and also brings in other related genes based on known associations from the peer-reviewed literature. Here we're going to look at a few of these networks in order to understand which molecules might be a part of a novel pathway or which molecules might be central drivers of the changes we're seeing in our experiment. In this case, we're looking at a few different networks, and the one selected in blue is a network for infliximab responders at week eight. We picked this one because we want to understand the network of genes that change in the responder group. We can already see the large number of differentially expressed genes, and we can see their high degree of relevance to immune processes using the top functions columns, which is on the right. Next slide, please. When you open the network for infliximab responders, you can see your data overlaid onto the network. The green ones are significantly downregulated in this patient group, and the white ones are additional genes that the algorithm has identified as being highly connected to the genes that did change in your data set. You can see a lot of genes connected to TNF are downregulated, and several are connected to the cytokines interferon gamma and IL-6. So what we're taking away from this is the actual target of the drug, TNF-alpha, is mechanistically connected to a number of genes that indeed change in expression in the data set and that seem to evolve a number of particular cytokines. This provides some insight into the possible mechanisms of infliximab activity. Next slide, please. Here, looking at the same network for non-responder data, you can see that many of the genes that were downregulated for the infliximab responders are now gray instead of green, which means they did not change significantly in the non-responder group. Next slide, please. We can summarize that responders to infliximab treatment decrease expression of genes in a network that centers around three cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-6, and interferon gamma. The non-responders do not show these effects. So we're seeing the downregulation of immune-specific network genes. For our final step, we want to figure out which molecules should be validated by qPCR. You have lots of choices. IPA has tools that let you select the genes in certain signaling pathways that are involved in particular processes or secreted proteins, et cetera. This is up to you based on your particular goal and experimental models. One option that makes sense here is to find genes that are known to be connected downstream of TNF in your data set and are therefore more likely to be a result, direct result of the antibody treatment. Let's see how we can quickly identify these genes. Next slide, please. IPA has tools that allow you to grow, filter, and connect molecules to discover relationships to additional genes based on particular biological criteria, such as molecule types, upstream or downstream neighbors, relation to disease, presence in biofluids, and more. You can also use these tools to drill down into a network and filter down to only those connections that meet certain criteria. Here we're going to use the GROW tool to find the genes in our data set that are downstream of TNF-alpha. Next slide. Instantly, you can see there are about 70 differentially expressed genes downstream of TNF-alpha in the responders to infliximab. From here, you could filter further to identify even fewer for validation. Again, you could pick some that are in certain signaling pathways, or you could pick only the ones that have an effect on inflammatory response or only cytokine-type molecules, et cetera. Or maybe you want to do qPCR validation first and then narrow down the list even further by doing ELISAs to find accessible biomarkers that might be found in blood or stool. IPA makes it easy to prioritize molecules and lets you do it in custom ways that depends on your own particular scientific strategy. This lets you, with your own expert knowledge of the subject, interrogate the list in different ways and drive the exploration in the direction you think is most relevant. Next slide, please.
Of course, the genes that you chose as a measure of response should not be affected the non-responders. This, this final step pulls out the view that are changed in the non-responders. Again, this highlights that non-responders don't have the same effect downstream of TNF. This is an interesting insight towards understanding mechanism. As a side note, the authors actually did validate some of these genes using qPCR and had good success confirming what they saw in the microarrays. Next slide, please. So in summary, you do need your list of significant genes. This is important. The list is the starting point for the rest of the research. It's not the end. Our goal is to add meaning to this list and help you interpret and understand what is going on in the experiment starting with gene expression data. Here we use functional analysis, signaling pathway analysis, and network analysis to explore biological themes associated with the gene expression changes. This addressed some of the key questions of the study and shed light on the unknown mechanism of drug response. IPA helps you identify relevant biological themes but lets you use your own knowledge, experimental model, or scientific strategy to discover the most interesting connections and explore the biology most relevant to you. We started with hundreds of differentially expressed genes and by making custom pathways, we narrowed that down to just 69 as an initial set for follow-up and could have easily reduced to even fewer using additional pathway tools. Next slide, please. And we'd like to acknowledge the group from Johnson & Johnson who did this study and published the paper. Next slide. So I hope that these presentations were able to demonstrate the importance of biological analysis strategies. By combining analysis tools and known biological knowledge in one place, you can connect known information with experimental data to help you move past gene lists to a deeper biological understanding of your data. The interactive pathway tools in IPA let you interrogate the data in your own ways, build custom networks, and relate gene expression information back up to various levels of biology. All of this helps you understand the impact your expression changes have on the biological functions, pathways, or diseases that are most interesting to you. This helps you quickly find interesting and novel connection and helps you get even more value out of your data. Lastly, as demonstrated by trends in grants and publishing, as well as the talks today, this approach is really considered the standard for well-validated conclusions. IPA alone has been cited in over 5,000 publications. I've included a short quote from a study by Thomas Kelder and colleagues that reinforces this need for a custom, exploratory, biological-based approach to analysis of complex data. Many researchers have come to the conclusion that deeper biological analysis is needed to effectively and efficiently pull the meaning out of complex genomics data. I hope this webinar has provided you with some strategies that you can use to do the same. Thanks. Back to you, Tamlin. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I just want to remind you one more time about the questions. Um, you can submit them anytime for Olga, Shelley, or Stuart. Uh, type your t question into the Ask a Question box and hit Enter. All right, so we have a bunch of questions. We'll get started right away with Olga. Olga, the first question for you is, is Bayesian data integration a publicly available resource or an available function of IPA? So in terms of IPA, uh, I think Ingenuity would have to answer about that. Um, I am not aware of it being a function of it, but they might have a different answer. Uh, we definitely have that as a publicly available resource. Um, the website that I put up of um, our lab, or it's, if you haven't written it down, it's function.princeton.edu, uh, so it's pretty easy to find. Uh, there's different Bayesian integration uh, network access points. You can basically pick your organism, and there's one for yeast, there's one for human. Um, we have one for mouse, which is actually already tissue-specific, um, and we have uh, actually a new system that we're about to release that will have a number of other organisms, as well as a way to look directly across organisms, compare networks. Uh, so if you have a gene of interest that you're trying to study in mouse and it's actually an ortholog of a human disease gene, you can see uh, how its function compares uh, in the different networks. So that should be coming very soon. It will be called IMP um, and should be released in about a month or so. So if you look at our website, that should be appearing there in a month or two. Stuart, do you want to comment on if Ingenuity has that as a function of IPA? Right. No, currently not. not yeah, we're not um, doing Bayesian analysis. Okay. All right, Olga, the next question for you is um, how are context-sensitive integration weights on data sets determined? What effects are there on different weighting schemes? So the way that that's actually done is that's essentially what the Bayesian network does, uh, and that's where these curated data sets are really important. So basically what the Bayesian network does is essentially learns how much to trust each of these uh, data sets that are, we're inputting in. So for example, let's imagine we have three different gene expression data sets. We have hundreds, but let's imagine a simple 
case where we have a data set A, B, and C, and A is really good in telling us about, uh, for example, it's, it's a, a DNA damage repair data set, and B is a cell cycle study, let's say, and C is something completely unrelated. Uh, so the Bayesian network, what it's going to do, it has no knowledge about, of course, what are the titles of these data sets. And in fact, often what is being investigated uh, is not necessarily always the only thing that we find. In fact, quite often we'll find uh, a lot of signal uh, in data sets that are investigating one biological question. We'll find signals for other biological, other pathways in there. Um, so what it does is it takes these uh, known sets of genes, uh, for example, from the gene ontology or from IPA, uh, basically sets of genes that are known to be related to a particular biological question, so DNA damage repair, say. So we know a number of genes that are known to be from the past uh, biological investigation involved in DNA damage repair. That's what we give to our system. And it essentially looks at these data sets and sees how these genes behave in data set A, B, and C. Uh, so, for example, if data set A uh, a lot of these known DNA damage repair genes are very well correlated, and we do very careful um, analysis on the correlation so that we can compare across data sets in these large compendia. But essentially, if they're behaving in a very similar way and actually doing something, uh, then that data set will be upweighted. That actually works, of course, uh, we look differently in, for example, physical interaction data sets. So if, if these data sets seem to be uh, representing the DNA damage repair genes well. So that's essentially how it's doing. And the context is coming from the fact that we only give it, for each context, the set of genes that are important to that context. So if the context is DNA damage repair, we would only give it to train the set of genes that are involved in DNA damage repair. If the context is DNA damage repair in a particular scene type, let's say, in uh, or in a particular organ, let's say, in the brain, we'll only give it genes that are known to be expressed in the brain and are involved in DNA damage repair. Hey, Olga, what is the ultimate proof for validating your predictions? So, I mean, the ultimate proof obviously is uh, experiments, and in fact, uh, we've actually tested quite extensively uh, in yeast our predictions, completely systematically for the mitochondrial biogenesis, and we find that, uh, in fact, we underestimate, if anything, at least in that particular process. We've tested about 300 predictions um, in a completely systematic way, no handpicking, purely ranked by the system. Um, and the accuracy was uh, actually higher than what we estimated from our computational evaluations. It was uh, over 60%. Um, it's probably actually higher than that because we only looked at single knockouts, um, and for the little bit of double knockouts that we've looked at actually shows that we are underestimating the accuracy even there. So uh, we've done this actually some testing, not in this large systematic way in human uh, and in mouse as well, and uh, we're able to find completely novel predictions that have no connection to these processes in the literature that we can then validate or our collaborators can validate. So that's definitely um, the big proof. Uh, we do do very careful, of course, you know, we can't test every single prediction, so we do do very careful computational evaluation as well, and there's techniques for that that essentially involve hiding some of the this training data, some of the data for which we do have answers, like, you know, basically hiding a subset of DNA damage repair genes, to continue my previous analogy, um, from the system, training it on just the other, you know, let's say we train it on 50%, we hide the other 50%, and then we see how well it predicts those 50% that to it are new. Um, and that actually works reasonably well, although at the end of the day, the proof is really in the pudding, or in this case, in the experimental validation. Hey, Olga, I have one more question for you. Where exactly do you get tissue specificity from? So um, in the systems that I've talked about, we actually get tissue specificity from public curated uh, data sets of uh, basically tissue-specific gene expression. So um, for human, we use HPRD. Uh, but essentially the idea is that you want genes that have a very clearly known tissue specificity. So it shouldn't be just from a microarray analysis, because then things would be circular, since we use a lot of microarray data sets in our system. So usually it's uh, in situ studies, um, some of these, you know, in other organisms might be GFP tags, things like that. Um, so once we have these sets of genes that are known to be expressed in a particular tissue or a cell type, um, then we can use that with our Bayesian integration as well as with our other computational methods to be able to train them to essentially identify from non-tissue resolved data collections, right? So in the data, the data that's going into these systems does not have a tissue-specific aspect to it. It's 
microarrays that are not specifically being microdissected to a particular tissue type or cell lineage, uh, for example. Uh, but essentially what happens is that, as we all know, the specific tissues and cell types have specific processes turned on or off and genes behaving in particular ways. So if we can, given examples of known tissue-specific genes, identify these processes, these ways that tissue-specific genes are behaving in a given tissue, then we can use that to try to identify additional tissue-specific genes, even from data that is not necessarily tissue-resolved. So um, that's what essentially we're leveraging. And in fact, we have a system called uh, Pilgrim uh, that you can, again, also find from our website, uh, that if you have your own sets of genes, I know there were several questions of people saying, I have an, my own set of genes for a phenotype, or I have my own set of genes for tissues, how can we use it? So we do have a system where you can actually go in and use your own set as a gold standard. It could be a tissue-specific set or set of phenotypes, and it will analyze this large collection of gene expression data um, and find additional genes that seem to behave similarly uh, in this very large data collection. So it weighs things uh, in a smart way based on your gold standard and then will find you new predictions. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that you can try and see if it works for you, and there's quite a few organisms up there. Uh, thank you very much, Olga. Um, Shelley, we have some questions for you now. Um, the first question is, can you explain the potential value of knockout gene models of disease, uh, mouse, et cetera? Sure. So in the event that you have a, a knockout mouse model, you can actually use a knockout mouse or a transgenic for that matter to mimic a disease phenotype. In most cases, it's going to be far more severe than the actual disease because most of the time you might have a partial inhibition of the function of a particular protein and in a knockout you don't have it at all. But it gives you some information about what tissues might be affected in that particular scenario and what pathways within those tissues might be affected. It also comes in handy if you are working on small molecule matter to attack that particular target. You can imagine a scenario in which you evaluate chemical matter against target A in both a wild type and in the knockout mouse. In the knockout mouse, when there is no target A, the information that you obtain um, allows you to understand whether or not your small molecule is truly specific for target A. And in addition to that, you can also get information on any compensatory effects that might occur from trying to inhibit or activate a particular target. So that's where the value of knockouts and transgenics can come into play. Okay, thank you. The next question pertains to raw p-value genes. How biologically significant are they? How do you determine if they're real signals or noise, and does it warrant experimental validation? So it absolutely warrants experimental validation. Um, in, in my experience, for the most part, when we do a microarray experiment, and let's say we want to do RT-PCR follow-up, it's much easier to get a positive result if you have a larger fold change. Um, some of the smaller fold change scenarios or where you've got barely detectable fold change but you have that significant p-value, um, I find that the success rate um, for follow-up on any individual gene is lower. However, if you look at the pathway as a whole and you look at the function overall, you might sometimes see the function of an overall pathway changing. So one example of that was the case where we were examining um, response to androgens and looking in some C2C12 cells that had been modified to express the human androgen receptor. And we had very small changes in gene expression, but the changes in gene expression suggested that there would be um, some DNA degradation occurring. And what we did was actually a nucleosome laddering assay. And we got a positive result there, even though we didn't have very strong data for several of the genes. So I, the example that I provided is an example of building a hypothesis that absolutely must be tested experimentally. And we should be thinking about the follow-up at not just the RT-PCR level for the individual genes, but also going a step further and asking the question, if a particular pathway is active, if it's turned on or if it's suppressed, 
what is the phenotypic result of that in my cell type of interest, and can I measure that? So we do need that sort of confirmation when we're trying to go down the path of looking at genes that have very small changes. In, in general, my philosophy is that biology is not always statistically significant. So that's the rationale for going into that space within the data, but it must be followed up. Um, Stuart, do you want to weigh in on, with this question? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with, with Shelley. The, you can build support for less significant change genes if they're if they're networked to the you know to the more significant genes or if they're in the same pathway. So you can sort of like an IPA, you can overlay the less significant ones and just see where they fall in a pathway, et cetera. And then you could sort of say, well, it's not significant in this experiment, but I better go back and get more samples or what have what have you to go back to the bench to see if maybe it really is significant if you had if had more data or did the experiment a little differently. So it's a good way to to not miss stuff without uh, but you do you do have to go confirm. All right, Shelley, I have another question for you. How would you correlate biological significance with statistical significance, considering that you showed differences in gene activity between p-value and fold change? Yeah, so I don't think that, like I just said, I don't think biological significance is always statistically significant. And I learned this, um, yeah, you can call it the hard way if you like. I learned this several years back doing a microarray study as part of a core service group and having someone come and tell me, well, this particular gene, based on everything I know, should have changed in this experiment. And I was looking at my microarray data, and I'm like, oh, well, I'm sorry, it's very, it's expressed at a very low level, it's in the noise. Based on the data we have, I really couldn't tell you if it changed or not. Everything indicates that perhaps it didn't change. And this guy went and did a northern and came back and waved his film in my face. Here's my gene, and it changed. And so as I think back on that example, one of the important things was that when we do microarrays, when we have microarray data, we do have to acknowledge that there is a region of noise in the data. And genes that are expressed at lower levels might fall into the noise, and we may not be able to detect and distinguish a change in those genes' expression level from the variability in our system. And so it's not a perfect platform. It does have limitations, and that's one of the places we run into limitations. Well, and let me add that, you know, sometimes, the, the, of course, the activity of the, of the protein is, is what's affected, and the gene may have changed a little bit, the expression of it, but if you have a really good reason to think this gene could be important, you, know, you could have an activity assay for the protein and, and maybe figure out that that's what's happening. Yeah, because yeah, you can have a kinase cascade be completely altered, and you'd be lucky if you see change in expression of a kinase or a phosphatase. Right. Okay, Shelley, I have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have one final question for you. Um, adipose cells are also accumulated in liver, whether in human or mouse, so it's important to tease these facts to understand the gene-gene interaction in your given pathway. That's a question, or? Yeah, so I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things we sometimes forget is that most tissues are not homogenous. So adipose tissue, of course, we're talking about a certain amount of connective tissues, some fibroblasts, some adipocytes, some macrophages. So it's quite heterogeneous. So if we wanted to drill further to ask what specific cell type we were looking at, we, um, were the changes that we were seeing, can we attribute those changes to a specific cell type? To me, that involves another experiment. It's not something that we can actually, we can come up with hypotheses and I think, you know, have reasonable good lives in the hypotheses and attribute a lot of the inflammatory phenotypes to the, to the macrophage population. But at the same time, we also know that um, adipocytes in and of themselves can have macrophage-like behavior. So I think that sort of question needs to be addressed with a follow-up experiment, a specific experiment, but I think it's, it really illustrates the point that when we name any particular tissue, every single tissue has different cell types within it. A liver is not a homogenous tissue. It is actually a heterogeneous, and there are publications that show differences in expression from one lobe to the next. So it's something that we always need to keep in mind as we design our experiments and interpret the data, you know, that that larger picture in which we place our data has to keep those sorts of points in mind.
Um, thank you very much, Shelley. Uh, Stuart, the first question for you is a multi-part question, so uh, here we go. Can public gene expression databases be used to compare the expression of a particular gene if they've been collected under different experimental conditions and by different groups? Can the inspection data be normalized and compared across these databases? Is it meaningful? And finally, how can you compare disparate data sets? <laughs> okay, uh, let me try to answer that. So, the in IPA, for example, the the, the magnitude of the of the gene changes aren't uh, we're not dependent on that. So we're actually uh, use the the, the upper down regulation itself as as the key. Um, metric that's used to, to compare. So, you know, in most data sets, the magnitude is what changes, but the, uh, on different platforms or whatever, but the actual direction of change is usually um, consistent. So that's, that sort of gets around most of those problems. Um, and so, it, you know, it is meaningful. Um, in fact, I'll, me, there's another question I saw coming up that's about, uh, you know, should you analyze the up versus the down regulated or both? And uh, actually, you can do, you know, can do in stages, you can first. I, what I first recommend is just looking at all all the data. Don't do any kind of filtering. Just sort of um, see what you get in, a, in an analysis, and then you can start doing more slicing and dicing of of what goes into the analysis to try to tease out more subtle effects. Like only look at the downregulated genes and see what happens. So, again, those are consistent across platforms uh, generally. So you're pretty safe, and uh, it's it, it works. Again, there's you know. It, it's 5,000 publications <laughs> for IPA. That it's a pretty um, compelling. Okay. Um, the next question is um, how to integrate microarray data with other data sets like miRNA, phenotype, epigenetic modifications, protein protein interactions, et cetera. Right. Um, so IPA uh, can handle those, those kinds of uh, different data sets. In fact, specifically for microRNA, we have a tool that came out this year that's really cool. It, you can take a microRNA data set and uh, put it into IPA, and you automatically can return all the t predicted targets and validated targets. Uh, we have different sources of prediction and validation uh, targeting the information for, for microRNAs to, to their mRNA targets. You can put the microRNA data set in and um, automatically connect it to its targets, and then you can do uh, filtering of uh, or an, an analysis of what the tar what targets came back. I only want targets that are in cancer. I only want targets that are known to be involved in this uh, in this pathway, et cetera. And so it allows you to integrate those two data types very um, closely. Uh, we also, uh, yeah. So that's the the kind of, you can put in very different kinds of data as long as uh, you, and you can load them in and you can do analysis in IPA. It doesn't depend on just um, mRNA expression. It's, you can also to put in uh, metabolites and do metabolomics analysis, for example. Okay, uh, Stuart, the final question for you is, if you don't have an initial thesis for your study at the beginning of your analysis, how could you start to analyze data? Are pathways a good option to start with the analysis? Yeah, so I think they are. I, if I put in a data set that I've, you know, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, I'll look at pathways, functions, um, which are sort of, you know, groupings of genes in various biological processes without necessarily being all in the same pathway. They're, they're just involved in the same uh, activities in the, in the cell. I look at functions like that. I look at pathways um, as the primary place to sort of start to understand what might be going on. And I look at the most, you know, most significant stuff first. Sometimes the most significant uh, result doesn't make sense off the top of your head, and then if, but as you dig down into it, you start to understand it's because a certain uh, set of genes are involved. Uh, so it's 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 an exploratory tool where you can you can generate ideas and move from there. So you don't have to have a hypothesis going in. That's helpful, but you know, you don't have to. Um, Jelly, we just had one more question come in that we're hoping that you can tackle for us. So we have a couple minutes left. Um, what are the advantages of building your own network rather than analysis? rather than analyze those generated by IPA, it seems to me that the latter is more straightforward and relevant. So I think that IPA does a nice job of putting some networks together, but those networks are actually binned. And the reason that I like to build my own network from some core gene or genes that I'm interested in is the actual placement of nodes in the network is actually based on the data set that I generated, whereas the preset network are based on the entire database of knowledge that IPA has about a particular gene. When you build your own network, uh, 
the network is built based on what you observed in your experiment, and I think it's more likely to be reflective of the particular model that you ran and investigated for the study. All right. Thank you, Shelley, for tackling that at the end. Uh, we've run out of time. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. There were a lot of really great questions, and we will be sending them to Ingenuity, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengenews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. Once again, I want to thank Olga, Shelley, and Stuart, as well as our sponsor, Ingenuity Systems. Um, we'll be sending a survey shortly and hope you take the time to respond. Your comments will help us continue to provide topical and timely webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you.